morning class. <laughs> Welcome to number seven. Just fixing that camera up. Right, today I pulled the lust card, number 11. In the major arcana, it's the justice card, but in the Thoth Tarot, it's the lust card. It's the allowing yourself to have your animal side um, it doesn't mean be rebellious or animalistic. It's more about being able to acknowledge that you do have that part of your life. So there you go. Happiness and joy. That's a great card to get. Let's start off the reading session. It's raining here in Queensland. So it's a great day just to sit and read a book. Now we're starting off with Pagan and... So we're in Tasmania and it's night time. Demeter had fallen asleep reading a bundle of hand-picked books. Peaceful in his slumber, one hand hung over the edge of the bed. Pagan gently slipped his hand underneath the doona and kissed his forehead before turning off the bedside lamp. To Pagan's surprise, Deity was sitting up in bed still reading. Raising her right eyebrow, Pagan scolded her daughter. Young lady, you should be asleep. Deity pouted, but mummy, I'm not tired. <laughs> yes, but I am, Pagan said. Her daughter had already mastered the art of emotional manipulation and Pagan was proud of the fact. Deity was reading William Shakespeare's play, Love, Labour, Lost. Oh, Missy Moo. You're far too young to understand that book. Snatching the book from Deity, Pagan placed it back on the bookshelf and sat down beside her daughter on the bed. Deity, you know that you and Shakespeare, Shakespeare were exceptionally good friends and you still have the same red hair as you had in your last reincarnation. Do you remember any of these things yet? She shook her head. Deity's memory was like a jigsaw puzzle. She had all the pieces but was unsure of what and where they went. She was splendid in appearance, encompassing, um, in, encompassing, no, I guess you're going to say, a humble self-esteem and wit. As a mere human, she would be admired and despised. As a daughter, she was loved by both her parents, and as a witch, she would surpass all others. Deity had a great respect for both females and males, and she would once again show great compassion for all of humanity and witches. Deity snuggled into her doona. Alchemy the kitten was nestled beside Deity's feet. Mummy, can you tell me the story of the red-haired men? Again. Balking, Pagan struggled to find an excuse not to. The factual story held immense pain for Pagan, but she was aware of its importance, so she told the story as often as she could. It was, the, it was pivotal that Deity knew her an ancestry, even though it was deeply disturbing. Snuggling into her mother's torso, Deity rested her head on her mother's shoulders. Many moons ago, witches lived in large, isolated communities. Witches were great warriors who protected humans. We were wonderful neighbours. On special occasions, strong and smart men would visit the witches and there would be a great fertility festival and lots of maidens were conceived. One day... A fleet of red-haired men arrived on our shores and they brought with them a new magic, strong weapons, disease, and a thirst to conquer. Many of our human friends died even when we fought beside them. Deity interrupted, Mummy, did you fight? No, honey, remember? I was only a baby when the black and red war began. I would have liked to have fought though. Pagan kissed Deity on the forehead and continued, after years of bloodshed, the weary witches negotiated with the red-haired men. Why, mummy, why? Well, it certainly wasn't for peace. Witches were dying out and we needed to make more witches to continue fighting. If we all died, who would protect the humans? Most of the nearby male humans were dead or isolated from us. The red-haired men were gaining strength. You weren't giving in to them. Laughing, Pagan continued. It was decided we would breed together, make a super breed. The plan was that once witches became pregnant, they would slaughter the redhead men. 
But mummy, even if you all died, you would have been reincarnated. Pagan mulled over deities question. The redhead men were destroying our culture, weakening our magic and connection to the goddess. They wanted to own us, put us into slavery. We had to eradicate them. After all, once a redhead man was dead, he was gone forever. Deity puffed. So you're saying that witches are just as mean as the redhead men? Lowering her voice, Pagan searched for a just answer. Tears welled in Pagan's eyes. I am ashamed of witches, what witches have become, but I am not ashamed that we fought for our own culture. As your memories solidify, you will remember that you too have made decisions that at times seemed justable or justifiable, only years later to be deemed barbaric. Screwing her face up, Pagan realised that Deity was too young to understand the point in which she was trying to make. Mummy, tell me about Auntie Anana. Pagan shuddered. She would need to use censorship to continue. Auntie Anana's name was Aphrodite, as I've told you before. And she presented herself as a potential... Mm, Pagan desperately searched for the right word. Let's say wife <laughs> to Gore, the leader of the redhead men. She had also captured the affection of Gore's younger brother, Tonic, but she had set her sights on the main prize and she would use her beauty to achieve it. Davy clasped her hands together. How pretty was Auntie Inanna? Aphrodite was breathtakingly stunning. Cherry red lips, wild green eyes, a long forehead, pointy nose, and raven black hair that hung down to tickle her bottom. She was presented to Gore, naked except for a leather belt that hung loosely around her voluptuous hips and a sword tightly fastened to her belt. Gore was completely seduced. Daddy squeezed her mother's thigh. But mummy, didn't Gore love you? Pagan snapped. Do you want me to finish this story or are you going to keep interrupting? So huffing, Deity slid down into her bed. Right. Gore agreed to their partnership. They would make strong males and finally he would have control over the witches. This is when witches started to give birth to human babies and non-ancient witches. The intoxication of our energies had begun. A truce to the war erupted into celebration. Pagan stroked Davy's forehead to help her settle. While Gore enjoyed the festivities, in his peripheral vision, he saw a dark shadow enter the surrounding forest. Intrigued, he followed it until it led to the maiden sitting alone in a clearing. That was you, mummy. Davy, would you like me to finish the story? Pagan asked sarcastically. Clearing her throat, Pagan continued. He sat down beside her. What did you look like, mummy? Pagan humoured her. I was told my skin was so pale that you could see my veins. I had pink lips and solidite blue coloured eyes and a cheeky grin. Gore was a giant of a man and me so little. Daddy grinned. She loved the story of how her true daddy and mummy met. I placed my pale hand over his large tanned hand and for a while we sat in silence. Pagan's heart raced. The memories were still raw. I asked him if he could see the goddesses in the forest. He was blinded by his, I, he was blinded by his own ignorance. I amused him, I think. Did you love daddy straight away? I wouldn't say it was love, simply a knowing, I suppose. You need to remember that daddy was almost 40 years older than me. Anyway, he felt the strong connection between us. Perhaps we both we had both been placed under a spell unbeknown to us. He decided to marry me instead of Aphrodite. How angry was Auntie Aphrodite? <laughs> Very angry. So angry, in fact. She cut her luscious black hair off. In her rage, she cursed me to death and as, pu and as punishment, oh, to death and as punishment, the goddesses turned her golden hair in, uh, as a reminder of her betrayal to another witch. Cursing another witch was, so I'm just gonna put this down, punishment, just in case. The goddess turned her gold, gold and her hair golden as a reminder of betrayal to another witch. Cursing another witch was and is unacceptable. 
Hexing another witch is the lowest. Pagan chuckled at the irony. I was so frightened of Aphrodite and as karma would have it, we have been reincarnated ever since until we find it in our hearts to forgive each other. Glancing at the wall clock, Pagan realised it was late. I better wrap this story up, she winked. Everything changed. Witches and the redhead man formed a weak alliance, but rape and brutality cemented a penis rule. Witch magic was forbidden and we were not allowed to commune with the goddesses. Consequently, humans forgot their alliance with us, turning truth into myth. Goddesses were fading away. One day, Gaul's younger brother, Tonic, formed an alliance with Aphrodite and together they raised a small secret army to overthrow Gaul. Pagan patted Deity's arm. I will bypass the violent betrayal as it might give you nightmares, but Tonic and his followers did bad things to me before they cut my head off, placing it on a spike outside my hut. Remember, Auntie and Nana is sorry for doing that to me. <laughs> Reaching for her neck, the memories were almost too painful to continue. God found, Gore found my mutilated body and cut out my heart and then ate it. Heartbroken, he slit his own throat. As he bled to death, he cursed his gods and the witches who betrayed us. A mighty thunderstorm erupted, causing great destruction to the village. Witches took advantage of the chaos, slaughtering the redhead men as they ran. Witches were not afraid of the redhead men's gods. The curse, however, tied Gaul's magic to my magic and forever we were bound to each other. He is the only male to reincarnate and we are famously called the soulmates. Pagan enveloped deity with a tight embrace. And that is why you're so special, deity, because you have daddy's magic and mummy's magic. Deity smiled. And he always finds you, mummy, doesn't he? But mummy, why do we hate non-ancient witches? Surely it's not their fault. Pagan scratched her head. Because Gore's curse affected all first reincarnated witches born after that. They were born weak. Their magic diluted. We do not consider them pure. So we hate them because they are weaker than us? A snort escaped Pagan's lips. And therefore, you are a great witch deity. You don't fear change. Pagan rubbed her eyes. I need my beauty sleep, deity. Not all of us are born beautiful like Auntie Anana. Pagan su suspected that deity would fall asleep quickly, the advantages of youth. Tucking her into bed, she kissed her on the lips and turned out the lamp. Pagan winced as she remembered her mother's predictions. There were witches who would see deity destroyed, believing she was the reason for the contamination of their energies. If she lived, non-ancients would be born. She had to keep, she had to keep her child safe. So we're moving on to chapter four. It's seven o'clock in the morning and we have Hensley. Hensley woke exasperated by another nightmare. Desperate for comfort, she grabbed her photo frame from the bedside table, placing it over her chest. Gulping down the sadness, memories of the last time she saw her father suppressed her happiness. It was, it had been an overcast summer evening, the kind of evening that makes you feel grateful to be alive. He had waved goodbye, regretful that he had been called back to, to the office over a trivial matter, thrown his car keys into the air and caught them. Hensley had laughed as he tooted the car horn. Ruby and Hensley had waved him goodbye without knowing that it would be for the last time kind of sad. That evening they had watched television and gone to bed at 11 p.m. The coroner, re the coroner report stated that he had died of a massive heart attack at approximately 20 past 10, aged 36. A healthy man who ran 10 kilometres twice a week to have died of a heart attack was a shock. The cleaner found him at 6 a.m. in the, ne the next morning. Gossip soon spread that he had died of fright in um, in his office that night. The terrified expression on his face plagued the ambulance officers who attended the scene. Her mother had never allowed Hensley to look at the post-mortem photographs, but tended to agree with the ambulance, the ambulance officers. All the circumstances around his death was odd. 
Now, Hensley looked at the photograph of the man who had been very much alive. Two prominent grey wisps of hair highlighted his short brown beard. His hair was always short, but long enough for her little fingers to tug, which she did often. Always patient with her, never scolding, he preferred to sit her down and explain his reasons for punishment. A kind man, he did not deserve his fate. She missed him so much. Epiphany. How stupid had she been? Finally, it dawned on her why she was so distressed. Subconsciously, she was missing her father. She was turning 18 and her father was not there to help her come of age. What a relief. It must be, a it must be natural for a daughter who was celebrating a major event in her life to feel upset that her father would not be present. Actually, I am 18. Squealing with delight, she jumped out of bed and slipped her cold feet into a pair of pink thongs as she ran into her mother's bedroom. Ruby was already awake. Making a cup of tea, Ruby had slipped in, uh, back into bed to drink it. Qu uh, quickly placing her teacup onto the bedside table, she ushered for her daughter to join her. Hensley climbed in beside her, slipping underneath the doona as, she was still, as if she was still a child. Hensley poked her mother in the ribs. It's my birthday. Ruby wrapped Hensley safely in, uh, up in her arms and, and happy birthday, baby girl, she said. Releasing Hensley, Ruby bent over the side of the bed, grabbing a box from underneath. Enthusiastically, she presented the gift to Hensley. The box was small and immaculately wrapped in an elephant print paper. Elephants were Hensley's favorite animal. Hensley squealed with delight. She loved birthdays, especially when the birthday was hers. Tearing the paper off, she flipped open the royal blue jewelry box. Inside sat a white gold ring that cushioned a large round pink quartz stone. Hensley placed it on her middle finger. I love it, thank you. Ruby grimaced. Thoughts of Hensley's witch awakening smothered any happiness she might have felt on such an occasion. Any more nightmares, Hensley? Unconvincingly, Hen Hensley replied, no. Hensley's father had lied about his nightmares as well. Nightmares so intense that they had decided to sleep in separate bedrooms so Ruby could at least have a good night's sleep. You know, I'm sure your dad is looking down on you today. Graham would be so proud of you. Hensley also managed a grimace. So it's eight o'clock in the morning and now we have Morgana. Morgana squatted in front of the sliding wardrobe mirror. Fingerprints and smoke from the incense stick made it hard for her to see her image clearly. Clothes spread unevenly across the carpet. Damp towels scrunched up in the bed, uh, on the bed, makeup staining her beauty table and the, and the curtains closed. Her room was a mess and she had no intentions of cleaning it. After her mother finished an adult tantrum, she would clean the room out of frustration, huffing and puffing while lecturing Morgana for an hour on respect. But it was worth the drama to witness her always emotionally balanced mother slightly unhinged. Morgana stared at the mirror. Red lumpy rings around her eyes were getting larger. Her pupils were unnaturally dilated. Something was terribly wrong with her. Resorting to play the MP3 player on maximum volume had failed to reduce the static in her ears. She was going mad. Was this part of being a maiden? Checking her eyes again, um, she questioned if she, she should confide in someone. Mum, no. She already thinks I'm weird enough. Morgana decided to ignore her thoughts and focus on Hensley. Jealous that Hensley was attending her witch awakening, Morgana reminded herself that her 18th birthday was only six months away. Surely Hensley would tell her all the details of the ceremony. It was a pity that her friend had to go through it alone, but if anyone could handle the pressure of a witch awakening, Hensley could. Pushed into a playroom at age five, the two maidens had been forced to play while Auntie Pagan and Ruby had popped open a bottle of sparkling wine. The two maidens had stared at each other for a long time before Hensley made the first move, grabbing a doll and giving it to Morgana. The same doll sat on Morgana's bed. The alarm alerted Morgana. It was time for school. She promptly ran upstairs to the kitchen to pack lunch. Perched up, reading a magazine on the recliner, Anana looked at her, uh, looked happy to see her daughter. Good morning. 
Morgana ignored her, pulling out the breakfast bowl instead, a bowl she had deliberately slammed down on the kitchen bench to annoy her mother. It worked. Anana snapped. Careful. Smirking, Morgana opened the fridge to grab the milk. Pouring it over her cereal, she placed the bowl into a microwave for 30 seconds before sprinkling four large teaspoons full of sugar over her breakfast. Inanna snapped again. Seriously, Morgana, it's like you're 17 going on two. Morgana screwed her face up. Whatever. Throwing a magazine into the onto the coffee table, Inanna stood up. You'll regret that diet of yours when you're 40. It will stick to your hips and your arteries, young lady, I promise you. Morgana poured an extra spoonful of sugar over her breakfast in retaliation. Throwing her arms up into the air, Inanna ex exited the room. Have a good day at school, Morgana. Morgana finished eating her breakfast, throwing the empty bowl into the sink. It never occurred to her to wash it up after herself or put the milk back in the fridge. She left for school without packing a lunch. Hiding in the bedroom, Anana stared outside at the welcome view of the ocean. She would go for a swim before, we before the weather cooled. Looking at her watch, she counted the hours left. In 17 hours, Hensley will be a witch. Poor child. 12 o'clock, we have Faceline. Swal swallowing herbal pills, Faceline washed it down with dandelion tea. The tea burnt her lips. Overwhelmed by 12 o'clock, she locked the shop door and closed the curtains quickly before sliding behind the counter. Shaking, she sculled some cold water. It made her feel worse. Her body was un um, under enormous stress. Considering selling the shop, she weighed up the pros and cons. It was a successful business, but she doubted she would sell it. Online shops were killing shopfront businesses. Empty shops laced the mall. It was not a good time to sell, plus she loved working in the shop. At age 25, she had finally saved enough money to risk a business venture. The 21st century had allowed for many personal opportunities. She wanted to go back to a time when she created her own stress, before the cancer, when trivial matters concerned her. The, uh, the pot plants getting enough water or sun or sleepless nights due to the, queen, uh, the twins or Oscar pruning the roses back too far. Oscar pruning the roses that actually really annoyed her. Struggling to keep any food down, a plastic cup she had used to regurgitate the food, um, food sat beside her. She pushed the plastic cup away. Substituting solid food for freshly squeezed juices had not stopped her from losing weight. Oscar had mentioned several times uh, that she was losing too much weight, not that she had much to lose. She had just laughed and told him, I'm on a health kick to cleanse the chemotherapy from my body. It had wrapped, he had wrapped his arms around her, kissing her on the forehead and claiming that she was still beautiful whatever size she was. Good save. Faisaline looked at her watch. Hensley would be at school. Hmm. She had rung Ruby at eight o'clock to wish Hensley a happy birthday. Hensley had been excited. Dear goddesses, please help Hensley. Faisaline bent, uh, bent over from a sharp pain in her stomach. And dear goddesses, please help me. The pill lodged. The pain in her stomach was intense. She grabbed the plastic cup, regurgitating the pill. It's now two o'clock or oh, 2 p.m. and we're with Emily. Locking the front door of the florist shop, Emily sat down beho behind the work counter and lit a cigarette. She spoke, uh, she smoked quickly, uh, the smoke quickly blanketed the room. Taking an exaggerated drag, the smoke traveled quickly to her lungs, giving her the kick she required. Two coffee cups still sat on the bench from the morning, one laced with a sleeping potion that Faisaline had made, especially for Emily to use. Pouring the tasteless potion into the morning coffee, Emily had handed the cup a little too keenly to her employer, who had taken a sip straight away. Her employer's eyes had heavied, and after roughly four minutes, she had collapsed into the office chair, falling into a deep sleep. Sleeping beauty, urban style, Emily had laughed. Dragging the office chair out of sight, Emily slammed the office door shut, locking it from the outside. Just in case she woke, Emily checked on her employer several times during the day. Stirring once, Emily had quickly held her employer's nose, pouring extra sleeping potion down her throat. 
It was unprofessional to drug her employer, but Emily had decided that it was simply taking charge of a situation that required action, especially before she murdered the motherfucking bitch. Plus, a whole week with a psychologically damaged human in a small shop was too much for Emily to handle. Cigarette ash fell on the floor and Emily spread it out sparingly uh, with her shoe. The sunshine was breaking through the clouds, which consequently warmed the shop. Emily still shivered for most of uh, for most of the day. It had been quite cold. Sighing, Emily reached into her dress pocket, pulling out a mobile phone. Quickly typing out a short message, she sent Ruby a text. Waiting for a reply, she finished the cigarette off, opened the front door, and tossed the cigarette bat butt out onto the main street. A lady walking by gave Emily an unamused glare. Emily responded by blowing her a kiss. Closing the front door, she checked the mobile phone again. There was still no reply. Ruby and Hensley had been through enough bullshit in the last few years without having to go through a witch awakening. The barbaric ritual should be banned, Emily thought. Infuriated, Emily threw her mobile phone across the counter. It landed on a pile of ribbons. If only those stupid crones would get with the times and pull their brooms out of their ass. So it's now three o'clock and this is Pagan. Slipping the loose fitted purple trousers down over her knees, Pagan sat down on the toilet. Diarrhea had kept her prisoner to the toilet seat for most of the day. Managing to escape the toilet for five minutes, she quickly connected, uh, collected Demeter and Deity from school at three o'clock with a tight hand grip. She ran back to the car, dragging the children behind her. Sitting in the car, she broke into an urgent sweat. Unlocking the door, Pagan locked herself inside of the toilet for another 20 minutes while Demeter and Deity ransacked the kitchen cupboards for chocolate chipped cookies to dip into a hot cup of Milo. Sugar and Milo sprinkled the kitchen benches with Demeter and Deity set, uh, sat on the couch in the lounge room watching the television. Looking at the mess in the kitchen, Pagan angered, fucking oath. Today was one of those days where the smallest thing threatened to cause a breakdown. Demeter muted the sound and with a frozen stare looked at Deity. Mum's crying. Deity walked swiftly to the kitchen where she found her mother bent over the kitchen bench sobbing. Are you all right, Mummy? Pagan wrapped her arms tightly around Deity and squeezed. Deity was lucky she would never experience a witch awakening if only every witch shared the same fate. Pulling away from her daughter, Pagan smiled. How about we fly around the backyard for a while? Mummy needs some fun. Deity instantly ran to the lounge room. Down our mummy said we can fly in the backyard. With the twins taking turns straddling Pagan's back, she flew around the backyard in an anti-clockwise circle. Memories from her previous witch awakening diminished any potential happiness she had. She may have had in the backyard with her children. Pagan landed the broom, allowing the children to fly alone. Walking back inside, Pagan walked to her bedroom and lay on the bed. Several half-read books sat beside her. Haphazardly, she chose the book on top of the pile. Reading the same pages three times, she hurtled the book across the room. Now, it is 20, it's 40 past 11 in the evening. A group of pseudo-witches, women aged over 60 with an intense desire to identify as real witches, formed a chaotic, pro, uh, chaotic protection circle in Aislinn's side garden. Wearing black cloaks for dramatic effect, they nervously held hands, excitedly waiting for instructions. The waxing moon vanished behind the fast-moving clouds only to reappear seconds later. The air was electric, the town eerily quiet. Although Hensley's witch awakening would take place in South Ryanna, 40 minutes west of Latrobe's northwest Tasmanian position, Ainsley was positive Hensley would benefit from a protection intention. As the sun had set, 11 women had arrived, in Aisl uh, arrived at Aislands wearing handmade craft frocks while holding badly made broomsticks. There was great excitement and envy when Aislinn appeared with an antique wooden witch's broom. Sweep ladies, we need to create a whirlwind. That afternoon, Aislinn had mowed the lawns and trimmed back the plants, disposing of the waste into the compost. Purifying the area, Aislinn sprinkled salt water over the lawn. The grass had hissed as the salt water touched it. An altar made from the 1960s coffee table was positioned in the middle of the lawn and a large black cloth thrown over it. 
Only a photograph of Hensley was placed on the altar. Once the circle was cast, they would need to remain inside the protection spell, circle until the mock spell was finished. Aislinn suspected that they would be closing the circle at 1 a.m. the next day. They would need refreshments. Aislinn encouraged the women to grab several bottles of semi-sweet mead, chalices and food platters to uh, sit beneath the altar. At the end of the driveway sat a pile of naturally cleansed rocks. Easily, each woman carried a rock in each palm, placing them in the large circle formation on the lawn. They finished the rock circle within 15 minutes. Bend properly. Hold your tummies in, ladies. Occupational health and safety belongs in the craft as well. Previously, Aislinn had collected the rocks in a picnic basket while walking along the mouth of the Mersey River. For added protection, they surrounded the rock circle with an additional circle of sea salts, tree branches and lavender bushes. Uh, four candles were placed to form a square within the circle. In the north quarter, in the north quarter, Aislinn placed a green candle to symbolise the earth. In the east quarter, a yellow candle to symbolise air. In the south quarter, a red candle to symbolise fire. And in the blue, um, in the blue, uh, and a blue candle set in the west quarter to symbolise water. The four elements were taken care of. The goddesses would be pleased. On entry to the circle, Aislinn wiped a small ochre-coloured paste on her forehead to encourage their third eye connection. It would help link their energies together, witches and humans. Once again the circle, or once inside the circle, the four candles were lit. A gust of wind assured Aislinn that the circle was now protected and blessed by the goddesses. Aislinn needed one more element to seal the circle completely, the feminine energy. Looking around the circle, Aislinn felt an overwhelming sense of pride. It was certainly a new beginning for female and witch relations. An early morning psychic vision had shocked Aislinn nine years ago. In that vision, she had witnessed an uprising of female empowerment, females fighting along witches and a new spiritual path created. The witches had excited, uh, the vision had excited Aislinn and she knew that from, that her personal path was to encourage the merge, the merging of all female energy. Witches and females would become allies. I think you, I think you need to remember the blood oath, mum, Pagan snapped after Aislinn repeated the vision. We can't renege on our agreement with the church. Women are gaining their power back naturally without you interfering. Leave shit alone. In the latter end of the 1400s, the highest priestess and the Sisters of the Moon, the modern-day crone monarchy, revealed to Pope Innocent VIII that witches did indeed exist and that it was time for the churches to stop prosecuting humans as witches. They wanted the witch hunting to stop. Pope Innocent VIII had been ecstatic by the revelation had been ecstatic by the revelation. I'm trying to find whether that is. Smug, in fact. He had been right. Witches did exist. Truthfully, witches wanted to stop hiding in the shadows of humanity. They needed protection. Their magic was dying. The 3,055-page Blood Oath Treaty was sealed with the blood of the highest priestess and Pope Innocent VIII and promptly placed in high security at the Vatican. Witches gained autonomy to govern themselves if they remained faithful to the Catholic Church and male superiority. Witches became fairy tales and the goddesses merely hearsay. Aislinn held a wand towards the moon. Diana, I ask thee, cast a circle thrice about, shield goddess, keep the male energy out. A silver shield rose from the ground, joining at the top, creating a large dome around them. They were protected. Ruby, this is 10 to 12. Curled up against a large willow tree in the backyard, Ruby peeled off long, thin pieces of bark, throwing them into a pile on the ground. Howling from grief, her screams were unheard. She screamed louder. A roar abandoned cry echoed through the surrounding paddocks. She stood up, stumbling backwards towards the house where she fell, landing on her hands and knees. She cursed the unknown monsters that would be soon be attacking her daughter. Throwing herself against the house, she finally collapsed from exhaustion onto the ground. So I've got to go back. So we'll finish there today. So needless to say, the witch awakening isn't very nice. You can get that. It's upsetting all the witches immensely. Um, 
and there's nothing they can do about changing it. It's something, oh, but tradition, it's tradition. You know, so we have to keep it no matter how barbaric it is. Um, you know, in some ways, I suppose that's come from, you know, like female mutilation um, in countries as well, but it's, you know, or even the removing of foreskin. Um, it's tradition. You know, it actually has no medical backing to it. It's not more hygienic. You know, they say it's more hygienic to have your foreskin removed. Is it? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we were made perfect. So how about we leave it? Um, so, and actually, it's really interesting. I don't want to get into the topic of, you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about now because, you know, I'm writing this 10 years ago. There's so many new things that people could be really argumentative about what I write, particularly, you know, I've got this purity thing going that females, it's the feminine energy that is witches. It's not the masculine. Of course, there's lots of male witches out there doing great things. But in this book, I'm talking about segregation. Um, and then also this need for um, the, the feminine and the masculine to be separated so that we can celebrate the feminine and we can celebrate the masculine separately and so they can become great in their own senses so that when we come back together, we're even better. So that's kind of where, why I'm doing these things is, you know, as you would know, men need men and women need women. Do you know, like I need to have my girlfriends. I need to have that time alone. Um, I enjoy male company. I've got many male friends, but I do know the difference, uh, especially with women's circles. When I take women's circles, men are not not allowed to come to, to the circles, but it certainly changes the energy within the circle. When you have um, all women of all ages together, it is extremely powerful. When you introduce men in, women tend to curtail themselves. They tend to not be as open, as expressive because, you know, because of all these prejudices, I assume that, you know, women are emotional, you know, and, and also on the flip side, there's many male groups, you know, that they probably don't want women walking in, do you know, because women could be appear to be judgmental. So I do feel like we need to separate. So we talked about at the beginning, pagans telling her daughter or trying to remind her daughter of the, the red and uh, black war. Um, I studied history and I remember a fleeting conversation about redhead men. And it was a mystery that in some history books, they talk about these redhead mystery men that arrived on the shores and I loved it. So I wanted to put that into my book series. Um, and obviously now you found out that deity has two magics in her. She has the, a masculine magic and a feminine magic. Um, and she's also, even though her mother is coming from a purity side, she is a, a, she is an ancient witch. After the war, all witches that were birthed, so you've got, I know it's confusing, so you've got witches, the, not, the ancients have been reincarnated for eternity. There were new witches, new energies birthed after the war. So witches were sprouting up, new ones were sprouting up, which you'd think would be good because it's a population thing. Maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe you need more witches to protect yourself. But the old witches, the ancient witches are seen because of their disgust for what went down, all they can see is impurity. It's like, bleh, like these are non-ancient witches and they're weak and they're pathetic and they can't even use power out of their hands. They've got to use wands, like, you know, Ugh, what are they? What do we even need them? You know, so there's this this power play happening within the witches section, and of course, and then witches started giving birth to male babies. So you know, and that was all witches started to give birth to male babies, and of course, male babies don't and they're not born with any magic; they're just uh, normal human babies, and they die. So you know, there, there's all this detox. Well, is it detoxification or is it? change is it good change you know it's it's your your job as the reader to decide with yourself with that um just going ahead to say but something so you've got hensley we found out that her dad has died mysteriously at work one night shock on his face um and so you know that i'm starting off there's going to be something about that. I mean, you know, there's going to be some mystery revealed um, later on in the book series. 
And so, you know, Hensley, as we know, she's an overachiever. She, she wants a lot out of life. She wants to be a veterinarian. Um, you know, she's quite, even though she's lost her dad and she's having nightmares and things have been, she's grieving. She generally is an upbeat kid, really. Um, and then, you know, so everyone, all these witches, because they know what this is and they can't stop it. They can't say, look, don't go and do this because we're going to get in big trouble. So you've got this establishment of witches allowing for an abuse to happen to another witch. So I am having a little bit of a go at at establishments, large establishments that are allowing things to occur because this is how it's always been. So, you know, Morgana, she's starting to really lose her mind. She's start, and she's not opening up to anybody. She's got an attitude. She's got a chip on her shoulder. She's her own worst enemy, Morgana. You know, she's hearing static now in her ears. She doesn't know what it is. She doesn't want to talk to anyone about it because she feels like she's going to be laughed at. Um, you know, and she can just see how rude Morgana is to her mum. There is so much resentment there. Like, and a mum is just like, I can't even deal with you. Like, you know, so that they're at an impasse almost with each other. Faye Celine, you know, has the cancer gone? She's, she, she seems pretty sick to me. Um, and then of course, Amy. Um, so Amy is now <laughs> like giving her employer a drug to knock her out at work. And I came up with this, well, I didn't come up with this idea when I was writing this. I remember when I was making a cup of coffee um, <laughs> for my employer at the time, and I was just like, <laughs> you know, like you know, and it was only my humor. I was never going to do anything, but I just, it was, I think I just needed to have dark laughter. Do you know, and I was just like, oh, it would be lovely to knock her out. Like, I didn't have to deal with her today. <laughs> <laughs> it's so evil, but I uh, like, and that made, I thought I'll put it in the book series because I'm sure there's plenty of us out there wishing we could put a little something in our boss's coffee to shut them up for the day. So, you know, this woman's sleeping all day. You'd think she'd wake up wondering what the hell happened, wouldn't you? So Amy's off being naughty. Um, and then Pagan, you can see Pagan's really badly reacting to what's going on with Hensley's witch awakening. She, she can't, like, she's having diarrhea, as we know, Emotion as a healer, emotion comes from your stomach, and we just quickly, you know, diarrhea is that you're certain that something isn't quite right if you've got diarrhea going on, um, and it's not necessarily a bug. You know, this is an emotionally driven um, health issue that she's having. And then Aislinn, I just love Aislinn, she's proactive. She doesn't give a shit that everyone thinks she's crazy. She doesn't care. She's got her own little followers happening. And she's, you know, she's going with this vision that she had that women and witches were going to come together as a, as a very powerful force in the future. So you're giving hope. I'm starting to give you hope a little bit that, you know, oh, we're all going to come together and women are going to be empowered again and they're going to learn ancient um, traditions that they want to learn. And so you've got this excitement that's happening there. And you have to say to yourself, well, is Aislinn, is she psychic? So is this actually going to happen? Or is this just part of her insanity? Like maybe, and even if it is part of her insanity, she's creating it. So therefore, it's almost like self-promotion um, uh, almost. That is like, well, I'm going to create it anyway, regardless if it was a true... Um, and, and people always say that about clairvoyance, that it's, you, you know, you're... you're putting in that, that, that thought that that is going to happen. So therefore we create it. Um, now just moving forwards. So now we're talking about, you know, we now know that the Vatican knows of witches. In fact, I'd love to give you a little bit of gossip in that, but I can't because I don't want to ruin the next book there. But um, Pope Innocent VIII, he was uh, the person who went right, Kramer, write a book, and go off and go and crucify as many people as you can, kids, men, and women, anyone who identifies, you think identifies as a witch. And it was a profitable business. It was very profitable um, because the church took all the wealth and property of that person who was um, convicted of witchcraft. So very profitable. And of course, you know, as we would have seen, there wouldn't have been proper representation. 
at the time. There wouldn't have been. There were some good arguments, of course. So I wanted to bring in Pope Innocent VIII because he was such a const uh, destructive human being towards um, the idea of witchcraft. Um, and then to have him go, oh, I was right. Do you know? Like he would have loved it. He so would have loved it if a bunch of witches turned up and went, by the way, you're right. You know, however, you know, we can change things. So, you know, the Blood Oath is an important treaty, uh, which they all take very seriously because it gave them certain wins um, and agendas, uh, even though it looks like that they're still very much contained and controlled. Uh, and so I'll, I'll end it up there. Look, I've got really poor internet. Um, my data is at its lowest, so it's taking me forever to upload these. So hopefully this one will come out tomorrow for you. Bye.